you I don't know as well as others, and some of you may not know that I grew up here in Cockeysville, Maryland, when it was a farm town. At what used to be called Cockeysville Junior High School, there was literally a barn next door with a silo. It's in the pictures in my yearbook, because they actually did have yearbooks then. But how many of you remember the Laney Valley Shopping Center, which is now called the Laney Plaza? You know where that is? Now, back in the day, there was an A&P there that was established in 1958. I was established in 1958 as well. <laughs> but next to it, or a couple stores down, was the best place ever. It was the S&H Green Stamps Redemption Center. How many of you remember S&H Green Stamps? Some of you are smiling. Some of you are looking like, what the heck is she talking about? <laughs> Mr. Barry, could you show us another slide? Oh, yeah, baby. There she is. Now, how many of you in the early 60s and late 50s did your vacuuming with your high heels on? <laughs> like June Cleaver. No? Really? That was all made up, huh? See, you could get all kinds of stuff with your S&H green stamp. But do you see that little circle I drew up there on the slide? It says, to fill a book, it only takes 1,200 stamps. Only 1,200 stamps to fill a book. You got a stamp for every $10 you spent in the grocery store. And in the 1960s, the early 1960s, groceries did not cost all that much. Let's go forward again. Oh, yeah, baby. Look at that stuff. Now, you know what things cost. You could get a King James Bible for one book of stamps. Nobody ever did that, I don't think. Um, you get luggage. You could get toys. Great toys, but thanks. The luggage costs five books of stamps. Can you imagine how long it took you to save five books of stamps? Because you'd pay for your groceries and you did not get a whole sheet. Sometimes you did if you spent a lot of money, but usually you got three stamps, two stamps, something like that. Now, if my mother ever got a whole sheet, I wanted to rip them apart and put them all in the book one at a time because it was more fun that way. At the height of SNH green stamps, they were circulating three times more stamps than the U.S. Postal Service, and their catalog of goodies was the largest publication in the United States. But then you'd go to the Redemption Center and everything was there in front of you. How many of you remember the Redemption Center? Trouble was, the good stuff was always up top. Because for one thing, you could never afford it. You never ate that many groceries to get that many green stamps. And the good stuff was always out of reach. So what does the word redeem mean or redemption? You know, I was an English major. I got to look up stuff, right, when I talk about a word. There are some very specific meanings for redemption. I want you to see which one you think is most closely associated with the redemption center of the SNH green stamp variety. The first is to compensate for the faults or bad aspects of something. To compensate for the faults or bad aspects of something. As in, a disappointing first inning was redeemed only by an outstanding effort from the bullpen. Oh, that we could say that about the Baltimore Orioles one day. Not quite the s and green stamp. The next definition might have it. To gain or regain possession of something in exchange for payment. As in, after he won at the track, he redeemed his father's watch from the pawn shop. Not quite the same thing. There's an archaic one attached to that as well that says um, to buy the freedom of. Because in the Bible, as well as our own nation's really worst moment, people who were enslaved to be Freed from slavery, the literal term was to be redeemed. It was called the redemption of a slave. I think this one does it more. To fulfill or carry out a pledge or a promise, she redeemed her screen stamps for a set of drinking glasses. That would only cost you like two books of stamps. Those little cheap glasses like you used to get at the gas station, that kind of thing. Good stuff, eight books of stamps. Can you imagine how long it would take you, how much bologna you had to eat in the 1960s to get eight books of green stamps? Well, I think some of these things apply to Jesus as well. We talk about, I know that my Redeemer lives. We're not going to go to that passage because I know that my Redeemer lives. Anybody know where that comes from? I'll give you a chocolate if you can tell me where that comes from in the Bible. Do, 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 do. That comes from the book of Job, and we're not going to go there this morning because that's crazy. But I know that my Redeemer lives. So what does it mean for Jesus to be the Redeemer? To compensate for the faults or bad aspects of something? I think that sort of nails it, don't you? Because Christ's self-giving love more than compensates for the fallenness of humanity. 
Whenever I baptize somebody, and especially when I baptize a baby and I say something about original sin, people are like, what do you mean? This baby's a sinner? No, babies don't sin. Now, even if they scream all night and mess up their diapers, they don't sin. What that's talking about is that we're born into a humanity in need of grace and that had messed up, that we need a savior. That's what that means. And some of the other words used for that sort of compensation are justify, vindicate, or absolve, or atone. Atone literally means at one. And atonement is at one meant. Jesus brings us into a good relationship with God, which goes to the second one as well, to gain or regain possession of something. In Christ, we were set free from slavery to sin. We were set free from slavery to death, because death really ruled the roost, didn't it, until the time of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. And it shows us the depth of God's love. There was no price too dear for God to pay to bring us home to him. God's love reclaims us because we once were lost, but now we're found, was blind, but now we see. You know that old song? But to fulfill or carry out a pledge or a promise means to make good on something. And certainly, God in Jesus Christ has made good on the promise that we would once again be reunited with our creator, the parent who loves us more than anyone ever could. But what if the church was to become a true redemption center? Not like the SNH Green Stamp Center, because everything there was unreachable. It was unearnable. It was impossible to get hold of. How many of you who went to, how many, raise your hand again if you know what a redemption center is and you ever redeemed anything for your green stamps? Any of you ever get anything really that good? You did? What'd you get that was good? Luggage. Ooh, you ate a lot in those days then. (laughs) Oh, people shared their green stamps then. Okay. Maybe you went to your neighbor's house and said, hey, look over there, and took their green stamps. Could happen. I bought some green stamps on eBay when I did a sermon similar to this one in the past. Somebody stole my green stamps. Somebody took them because they liked them. They said, that was so fun. I used to have this. I love this. Can I have this? And I said, well, I really want to keep them. And then they disappeared. Oh, well. They have no worth now. As of 2020, they went out of business. Yeah, Toby. Oh, Chuck E. Cheese. Anybody? Chuck E. Cheese is getting a little old, too. Or you ever play skee ball and get those tickets, that kind of thing, yeah. Skee ball. Everybody knows skee ball who's been to Ocean City. That type of thing where you do something, you get the little tickets, and you turn them in at the end. Well, it's not the parable of the Redemption Center, but there's something called the parable of the life saving station. I'm going to read it for you because I did not write it. I'm going to read it to you and then I'll tell you about who wrote it. On a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was once a crude little life saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat. But the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea, with no thought for themselves, went out day and night, tirelessly searching for those who were lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and gave their time, money, and effort to support its work. New boats were bought and new crews trained. The life-saving station grew. Some of the members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those being saved from the sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they decorated it beautifully because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea or on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do the work. Life-saving motifs still prevailed in the club's decorations. There was even a liturgical lifeboat in the room where the club's initiations were held. About this time, a large ship wrecked off the coast. The hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick. The beautiful new club was in chaos, so the property committee immediately had a shower shower house built outside the club where victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split among the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities as being unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out they were still called to a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station. 
So they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself, and if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs along that shore. Shipwrecks are still frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. Now, if you think it was written by some young whippersnapper or some progressive liberal guy, that was written by Dr. Theodore Waddell, who was a former canon of the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It means he was a big, high muckety muck Episcopalian. And he was born in 1931. That's before my mama was born. And he wrote this parable in 1953. Sometimes churches do become like that, don't they? We get so consumed with making ourselves comfortable that we forget why we're here in the beginning. We're here to save people's lives. We're here to offer them a fresh start. Or if you want to use the redemption center image, we're supposed to lift them up so they can get to the good stuff that seems unreachable and out of grasp. Barbara Brown Taylor is a former Episcopal parish priest who now is a seminary professor. She's considered still to be one of the best preachers in the country, and I agree with that assessment. She was asked to preach once to a convention, and she asked what the theme was. They said to her, why don't you preach on what is saving you right now? It took her back a little bit, and she thought, what is saving me right now? What is saving you right now? She started to think about that, and she thought, you know, if we ask what's killing you right now, people have an answer. If we ask what's hurting you right now, people have an answer. If we ask what's making you angry right now, people have a really quick answer. But what is saving you right now? What if we committed ourselves to sharing with others who are out there in the cold, wet, deep? What is saving us? Remember what it was like when we were cold and dirty and drowning ourselves? Then, folks, we would have a life-saving station, an authentic redemption center. That's why we chose a new mission statement. Who can name the mission statement without looking at the paper? I'll give you one of these chocolates up here if you can stand up and say the mission statement in its wholeness without looking at the paper. Do, 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 do. Our mission is to love God with all our hearts, to love others as God loves us, to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Say that with me. Look at the paper now. Or Barry, can you put it up on the screen? It's on the screen. Our mission is what? What was it again? Tell me one more time. If we were to do these things, we would have with the same love with which God loves us. And if we do that, we're going to be making disciples for Jesus Christ. One of my favorite parts of the story of 9-11, and there aren't many good parts of the story of 9-11, was a historic church in New York City. I can't even think of the name of it right now. But what happened in this church was it was a historic church. The congregation had shrunk. They were elderly and small in numbers, and they used their money to keep the building looking nice because we all want a nice-looking building, don't we? And our trustees here do an excellent job at making the building look good. But they were close to ground zero, and they opened their doors to firefighters who came in to sleep a little bit between shifts. They were sleeping on the pews and their boots were still on their feet. They were scuffing up these historic pews. Oh my golly, what's gonna happen now? The congregation was in an uproar and then suddenly they realized that what they were doing was being the church of Jesus Christ. They didn't even paint the pews and so now they have a monument there, a little plaque saying, this is in remembrance of those who gave so much to help others in their need. So I hope that you will Think about what is saving you right now. I'm going to give you some homework. I want you to go home and think, what is saving me right now? Maybe it's having the love of your family and friends around you at a hard time. Maybe it is being part of a congregation that loves you and misses you when you're not here. You know, this is my first real Easter at Epworth, my third year here, the first time we've been in the sanctuary for Easter Sunday. My first year I preached to a camera, my second year to people in their cars. This year I get to look at you face to face, and don't you all look good in a pew? 
I've never seen such people look so good in a pew in my days. But we've got to get out there. We've got to tell people what is saving us now. And I hope the answer ultimately is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Not in some are you saved way. Don't ever go up to somebody and say, are you saved? You might as well go up to them and say, I think you're going to hell. Because that's what it sounds like to people who don't know what you're talking about. But share with them, I once was drowning. Someone pulled me to shore. I once was cold. I was dirty. I was all these things. I was broken and bleeding. And I needed someone. And you came to me in Jesus Christ. In the next couple of days, we're going to put something new on the website. I hope you've all looked at our new website. A friend of mine from years past told me at our high school reunion that he got sober at Epworth Church. So I contacted him when I was appointed here. And I contacted him again and asked him to write a testimonial about what the church meant to him and what AA has meant to him. And that's going to be on our website on the 12-step program page. I want you to read it. Because what saves us is the power of God's resurrecting love that redeems all things. I know that my Redeemer lives. We didn't read that passage, but the one we read from Isaiah is pretty good too. It's the only time in all scripture that God says, I love you. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. So know when you leave here today that you're loved. Know that there was no cost too high for God to pay to bring you home. Then tell somebody how you got saved because there are too many people in the world who are drowning and too many people who think they cannot reach the good stuff. Give them a boost up and let them know that everything is available to them free of cost through Christ our Lord. Amen.